Well, good afternoon and welcome to everybody. I'm Melvin Levitsky, Professor of uh, International Policy and Practice here at the Ford School and a former uh, American diplomat, former Foreign Service Officer. Let me first uh, thank uh, the sponsors of this event, the Ford School, uh, the International Policy Center, headed by Jan Sven, Professor Jan Svenja, who's here, and um, the Weiser Center on Emerging, uh, Emerging, I was going to say Emergency Democracies, I wonder if that's a Freudian slip. Uh, Emerging Democracies and the International Institute. So, just to those of you who have been to some of these talks, I again have the great pleasure of introducing a former colleague and a good friend of mine uh, who is here at the school to give the talk uh, this afternoon, Richard Solomon, who is president of the uh, uh, the, in, the, uh, Institute of, uh, the Institute of the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C. Um, well, you have his biography, so let me just mention a few highlights of this and then say just a word about the Institute of Peace. I have had, I was on the board actually, or ex officio on the board of the Institute of Peace back in the early 90s as the State Department representative, so I just want to say a word about that as well. But some of the highlights of our distinguished guest's career, Ambassador Richard Solomon has his PhD from MIT, um, Asian studies and particularly China, a, a real China, a genuine uh, China scholar, um, particularly relevant to this audience and this university as he taught here at the University of Michigan from 1966 to 1971 in the political science uh, faculty. And then he had a fellowship. I uh, was called to Washington to work with uh, Henry Kissinger as a fellow for a year and ended up spending five years there during the Nixon uh, administration and Ford uh, administration working on uh, China policy through many events, including the opening to China, so he was uh, present at, uh, I wouldn't say the creation, but at least at a very important and interesting period of U.S.-China uh, relations. After that, in 1971, for uh, uh, 1976, for 10 years, he chaired the Political Science Department of the Rand Corporation and the Asian Security Studies uh, Division of, uh, at Rand. Uh, I first, we first met each other, I think, in 1986, uh, when I was, uh, or 1987, when I was Executive Secretary of the State Department, and, uh, and Richard was the uh, Director of Policy Planning in the State Department, and we both had the, the pleasure and the honor of working for Secretary George uh, Schultz during that period of time. From 89 till 92, he was Assistant Secretary of State for Asian and Pacific Affairs, and then from 92 to 93, Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines. And he has been President of the Institute of Peace, uh, U.S. Institute of Peace since that time. Now let me just say a word about that, because I think it's rather a spectacular presidency. When I was on the board uh, as ex officio member, and I certainly enjoyed getting out of the State Department and going over to the Institute for, for board meetings. Uh, the, board, the Institute actually uh, had its headquarters at the uh, building of the American Chemical Society. Small quarters, um, interesting work, fun, all funded by Congress, um, but kind of hidden and unknown uh, within the Washington atmosphere inside the Beltway. Um, now, Richard came to uh, head the Institute. What is, what is fascinating about this is the kind of support he has developed um, for the things that the Institute does so well. Sponsoring research on uh, peace studies, uh, training, uh, projects in a, a variety of uh, conflict situations around the world, uh, books that are published, he'll tell you about this, and of particular interest uh, to me, uh, this very interesting series on uh, uh, cross-cultural negotiation. So one of the things that the Institute does that's very interesting, which I should talk more about this, is interv do interviews 
with negotiators. And for this most recent book uh, that Richard has uh, written, uh, co-authored, uh, a lot of interviews, some 50 as I understand it, with um, people, uh, other negotiators who have negotiated with Americans. And then with a kind of ground truth in the, asking the Americans what they thought about what was said about their negotiating behavior in their negotiating style. It's a fascinating book, and uh, I, have, I hope my, my class is here. I hope you've all read at least the chapters I assigned for today's assignment. But in any case, the other thing that I would mention before turning over the podium is that there is, uh, uh, as a result of uh, Richard Solomon's uh, efforts and some help from some wealthy benefactors, uh, the U.S. Institute for Peace is now moving into a spectacular new headquarters at the old Navy Annex. If those of you who might know Washington, D.C., there's a corner uh, right across from the state, <coughs> across from the National Academy of Sciences, and, it, and within booking distance, at least, of the Lincoln Memorial. That is going to be um, the headquarters in a five-month <coughs> building is done of the U.S. Institute for Peace. Uh, which will house a number of these activities and we'll see a, a, a big expansion of things as well. So um, this will all go to his efforts and so it's with a great deal of pleasure and real honor to introduce <coughs> my former colleague and my friend, Richard, Ambassador Richard Solomon. Let's all give him a big mission. Call. I think the microphone works. Does it work now? No, no, I'm sub I have one of these gizmos. <coughs> and if it isn't working, our friend up there is going to figure out how to turn it on. Mel, thank you for, uh, there we go. There, thank you for your introduction. And uh, let me say it's really uh, a very nostalgic pleasure to be uh, back in Michigan. It was 41 years ago. It'll, my white hair is showing. 41 years ago, I began my professional career here in the political science department. And uh, those were wild and woolly times. The, the campus at that point, frankly, was in turmoil. The, the Vietnam War, of course, was at its height, and uh, this campus was a major center of, of protest in the war. There was uh, the reaction to effort to advance the uh, impact of the civil rights movement, the legislation of the early 60s, uh, and my classes were repeatedly uh, interrupted by, by activists. After the Kent State shootings in 1970, which most of you were born fortunately after that, but uh, activists came into my classroom and told the students to go out and buy guns because they were, according to these activists, the government was going to shoot them. Well, it didn't happen that way. and. Uh, Fortunately, we're, we're beyond that period, but uh, it turned out uh, just by, by happenstance that my training in Chinese politics uh, drew a, a very nice turnout, and I'm, I'm really pleased that you're all here today. But I remember going to my first class, and you know we don't train teachers really at the PhD level. I walked down the hall having never taught a course. MIT didn't use uh, teaching assistants. And I was told there was a registration of about, uh, about 60 people, students for the class. Well, as I approached the classroom, I could hear this buzz, and the buzz got louder. When I walked in the room, there were over 150 students standing around the outside of the, uh, the room. They had all come to hear me talk about how, much, how Chairman Mao made a revolution. They, they wanted to tear the place apart, and they thought I was going to teach them how to make revolution. <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little, if not a reactionary, at least a little more conservative than that, so they, they discovered that not, was not going to be the focus of my presentations. But anyway, it was, it was a wonderful start to the career, and uh, it's sort of ironic that Professor Levitsky and I have, have like, ships crossing, uh, if not in the night, at least in the middle of the ocean. He began his career in the government, is now teaching, and I've sort of gone in the other other direction, but I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to share with you some thinking about, about where the world is headed and the work of the Institute of Peace. There are the three wing things I would like to focus on today. That First is how the dynamic of international affairs 
has changed dramatically. And uh, the opening to China that I had the honor to participate in in the 70s was the start of a major shift in the Cold War period. Well, today we're in uh, another major breakpoint in history as I'll get off into, uh, into some detail. Secondly, to get into some detailed discussion about the challenges that we face in managing a whole new range of international conflicts that affect uh, American interests. And then uh, the third thing I'd like to talk about a bit is the work of the Institute of Peace. Uh, it is a rather unique institution that uh, I've had the privilege of uh, leading over the, uh, the period since the Cold War ended and we're doing, I think, some interesting work and we're trying to develop collaborative relations with universities. I've had a number of very uh, good discussions just today with uh, various uh, folks here at the Institute about the way we can develop some, some collaborative programming. Well, let me uh, talk about uh, how the world has changed. Let me get my clicker here just because at some point I want to change that slide. In the last century and a little more, the world has seen four major breakpoints in international affairs. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, after all the growth and the industrialization following our Civil War, the United States, as I think you all know, entered into world affairs. We, we took on uh, the Spanish first in Cuba and then acquired the Philippines uh, as a colony and up to World War II, uh, World War I rather, uh, we, we intervened in the, the problems of Europe and became a major factor in world affairs. But then something happens that uh, happens over and over again. You remember that uh, Congress rejected the League of Nations uh, proposal of the Woodrow Wilson administration, and we turned in on ourselves, withdrew from the world, and went through in the 1920s and 30s into a period of isolation. But then wham, World War II started, Pearl Harbor, and virtually overnight we intervened again uh, in international affairs. Uh, fortunately, World War II uh, was relatively brief, and, and by 1945, uh, with the, the war, War I, uh, we again demobilized virtually, virtually overnight. But then the Cold War started, and uh, beginning with the uh, Soviet subversion of Czechoslovakia, the pressure on Turkey and Greece, through the Korean War and the Cuban Missile Crisis, this country went through a third period of intervening in the world in its own interest, but a period that required a lot of soul searching and uncertainty about what was the character of the threat and how to, how, to, how to deal with it. And I would say, unlike World War II, where overnight we industrialized and took on Imperial Germany and Imperial Japan, in the case uh, of the Cold War, it took us almost 15 years to figure out policies that uh, would cope with the Soviet challenge. And we ended up, uh, after particularly the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, with policies of deterrence and containment of Soviet challenges that were able to generate uh, public support uh, and avoid uh, all of the horrors of what could have been a, a nuclear war in the case of, in the, case of uh, the, the Cuba situation. Well, today we're, we're in the fourth major breakpoint um, uh, in world affairs, uh, and that was, of course, triggered off by 9-11. Uh, by and I would say we're, uh, again, in an extended period of trying to figure out what is, what is the character of the threat that we're facing. Uh, this history is worth, in this very broad brush uh, fashion, looking at because it, it emphasizes a couple of uh, repetitive aspects of our history and our way of dealing with the world. First, we have this pattern of out and in. We, we really don't want to get involved in the world, but things going on out there do affect our security, do affect our economic interests. And so after pulling back, uh, and most recently after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, we hoped there would be a peace dividend, and again, we, 
We substantially withdrew funding and support from our national security organizations. 9-11 comes along and we have to intervene uh, once again. So one of the issues that uh, above all uh, our Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, talks about, and I'll uh, draw on Gates' wisdom a little more as this talk proceeds, is can we break out of this pattern and maintain a more of a, a steady uh, maintenance of capabilities appropriate uh, to dealing with uh, the challenges of the world? Can we avoid these, uh, uh, in the case of our current situation, an extended period of uncertainty about how to deal with the world? Who's the enemy or the adversary? Is it Islam? Is it uh, religious extremism? Is it cyber warfare? Is it uh, the problems of energy security? Is our problem gonna be China? You can just tell reading the newspapers that our public debate is very confused about uh, where to focus our attention on, on which challenges of the many that in fact we do face. Um, <clears throat> The other thing that uh, you, you feel keenly working in Washington is that the institutions of government, uh, particularly the uh, defense and state departments, the intelligence community, uh, the economic agencies that were created at the end of World War II, it's, re it's basically, and I'll maybe overstate it a bit, uh, it's really a broken system. And uh, we have seen our, our big bureaucracies struggling to adapt to the post 9-11 world. Probably the most adaptive has been our military uh, because they're on the front lines and uh, uh, they have tried to make this transition from knocking off Saddam Hussein's conventional military uh, to dealing with insurgencies. The intelligence community trying to figure out how to support uh, the military and, and other agencies of government in dealing with this world, the economic challenges and again, a, an agency that uh, is trying to define for itself how it deals with the world after it was substantially underfunded uh, with the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union. And uh, I'll get off into a little uh, more detail later about the work of the Institute, which uh, is uh, really designed to try to help our major agencies of government uh, deal with this world. So what can we point to as the character of the, of the world that, uh, that we're now uh, confronting? Because it really is uh, quite a change from earlier periods that even, even I, at my advanced age, have lived through and, and many of you have approached. Uh, in the 20th century, of course, the, the big problem was imperial powers, uh, Japan, Germany, and then the Soviet Union uh, the coalitions they built, presenting us with a conventional uh, military threat. Uh, but today we're not fortunately blessed with that kind of a military confrontation. The big problem, as we've seen it, are weak uh, or failed states that have been taken over by subnational organizations or supranational organizations uh, with global ambitions who want to use a weak state system in a parasitical way to uh, project their power. And they've learned how to use technologies, uh, whether it's air transport systems, the internet, uh, and uh, as they try to increase their power, looking for uh, uh, access to nuclear weapons and other weapons or techniques of mass destruction uh, to prevent us, present us with challenges uh, that we're struggling uh, to deal with. And uh, so this is a range of challenges that again are, are confronting, confronting our people uh, with unfamiliar uh, issues. What's been conventional warfare, again, irregular warfare, the problem of terrorism as, as new challenges. The nuclear standoff. During the Cold War, of course, the Soviet Union and the United States maintained a kind of discipline over nuclear capabilities. But that is substantially broken down. And we see uh, day by day in the press what's going on in North Korea, uh, what's going on in Iran, what has happened in Pakistan, uh, that the, the proliferation issue 
uh, is really a, a profound uh, challenge to not just our security, but that of, of many other countries. And uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, uh, the UN Permanent Five Security Council, uh, they're just not able to get a handle on this issue, so the proliferation problem advances. The ideological rivalries that we were familiar with during the Cold War period and earlier, fascism, communism versus our efforts to promote democracy and, and uh, free markets. Uh, today, issues of religious extremism and uh, ethnic conflict. The State Department, and I'll get off into this in the work of the Institute of Peace, the State Department <laughs> does not have a Bureau of Religious Affairs. But when uh, the conflict in the Balkans began, we saw that it was driven substantially by religious tensions. Well, the Institute of Peace had a program in religion and peacemaking, and so we began to fill a space that, in this case, the State Department didn't have the capabilities, the experience, the handling, and we'll, we'll pick up on some of those other issues. During World War II, civilian populations were the targets of a military attack. We were trying to destroy the, uh, the manpower behind the industrial base of Germany, uh, Japan. We're in a very interesting period where uh, hostile publics have become a, become a weapon uh, used by the bad guys, those out to do us harm. Uh, we see it particularly in the, in the diverse Muslim world uh, where our traditional notions of public diplomacy, of reaching out to publics uh, through the voice of America, through, through other instruments that we did use effectively during, uh, during the Cold War years are unable to reach publics that are basically very hostile to us. Why is Osama bin Laden still on the loose? It's basically because he's operating uh, not just in a mountainous terrain, uh, but in a cultural environment where people are willing to protect him. So uh, whether it's uh, that kind of protection, whether it's recruiting uh, suicide bombers or, or other problems that we have funding terrorism, we're dealing with publics that we don't know how to reach. And uh, so again, it's a, a major change in world affairs. And finally, I just note that there are a new range of issues that we see affecting our security that we really uh, have not dealt with before. Um, the economic interdependence that's grown in the post-Cold War period, challenges of energy security, the impact of climate change. These are issues that uh, are not dealt with by in any sense through military means. And so we are in a period trying to adapt our national institutions uh, with policies designed to approach these, uh, uh, these new sets of problems. <clears throat> now, one of the things that's uh, debated and, and still very much under discussion in Washington is how to uh, move away from what people look at as the excessive militarization of our, of our foreign policy. The fact is, after 9-11, the major instrument with which we responded to the world uh, was our military. The US military is very well funded. It's, uh, it's got the resources, it's got the training, uh, and the organization to be an effective and what's turned out to be a very adaptable organization. But uh, there's a lot of concern that the military is uh, predominant in our dealings with the world. Now this is uh, Bob Gates, Robert Gates, a, a man who uh, was a colleague in earlier times in government who, uh, in my view, is really a transformative uh, defense secretary. And one of the dramatic things in his tenure is he recognizes the limits of, of the military as an instrument in our, our foreign policy. That he, he understands that uh, uh, economic issues, promotion of the rule of law, uh, dealing with civilian uh, society, building public services, uh, et cetera, that these are the requirements that we have to uh, bring our government uh, 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 to be able to project in our dealing with the world. 
and uh, perhaps most dramatic at all, uh, virtually every Secretary of State that I've worked for, Mel has worked for, has, has appealed to Congress uh, for more resources for the State Department. And generally it falls on deaf ears. There is no constituency in Congress or in the public for the State Department, but there is a big constituency for the military. So the, the military, as I said earlier, is, is well resourced. Uh, but here you have a Secretary of State that not only says we have to get uh, the American civilian agencies, the diplomats out in front, uh, but I, Secretary of Defense Gates, am going to give, what was it, $700 million to the State Department to increase their, their personnel base and to retrain them so that we will have the civilian capacity uh, to deal with the, the new challenges that uh, I've talked about uh, a moment ago. And that's a pretty dramatic uh, development in, in the, the politics of Washington. Now this, this brings me to uh, uh, the Institute of Peace. Uh, the Institute was created in the wake of uh, the Vietnam War and uh, all of the, the tensions around uh, uh, the nuclear standoff with the Soviet Union. Uh, a number of senators got together in uh, 1976, Mark Hatfield and uh, uh, a number of uh, Democrats around him, uh, passed legislation uh, establishing a commission that looked at creating a new organization which they hoped would be what they called the National Peace Academy. Uh, Senator Spark Matsunaga from Hawaii ended up chairing a commission which uh, in 1981 recommended to Congress that a four-year training institution like West Point or Annapolis would train peacemakers. And uh, it was a bold uh, proposal which actually had very interesting historical roots. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, look, look at the history of, of uh, uh, earlier presidencies and actually you've got to go back to George Washington's time. Uh, at the time that uh, we are making the transition from the Declaration of Independence to uh, the establishment of the United States as a government, a uh, governing set of institutions, Washington proposed the establishment of a peace institution. Now what he had in mind was uh, creating the military capacity to deal with the fact that the French, the British, the Spanish, the Russians, there were a lot of uh, uh, European governments poking in on us. Uh, there was, of course, uh, still a lot of conflict with uh, the Native American tribes. Uh, and so Washington's notion was pretty, pretty militaristic, but his instinct was to uh, have a peace-oriented institution. And if you look at the weather vane atop Mount Vernon, the, uh, Washington designed it as a, a dove of peace. So, and uh, there were others in his time, uh, Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Benjamin Banneker, who were proposing a somewhat more peace-oriented notion of an institution, but there was a realization that we needed to train people to deal with conflict. And then during the remainder of uh, uh, the 19th century and through the 20th century, because of the character of the conflicts that we faced, the military gained the support of, uh, of uh, Congress and, and the public as we tried to deal with uh, challenges from, from the world out there. Why did things change dramatically uh, uh, in the late 70s? I think people in part saw that and were just uh, devastated by the searing experience of Vietnam, but they were also looking at the, uh, the challenge of, of nuclear war and concluded that if we didn't deal with uh, international conflicts in a different way, uh, we were gonna run into uh, serious trouble. So the, the Congress, uh, during the Reagan administration passed uh, an act creating the U.S. Institute of Peace. And uh, here you see its, its basic charter as an education and training institution trying to uh, uh, build a cadre of civilians trained in conflict management. Now, 
what really were they going to be trained about? This gets to uh, how the work of the Institute is, uh, is managed. And uh, uh, this is the, uh, the vision that we have brought to, uh, to our work, and that is to figure out if there are more nonviolent measures that can manage these international problems, put more emphasis on preventive action. I mean, one of the things we see over and over again, you get caught in a conflict and the military costs in lives and in money are excessive. If we only could have prevented the conflict from breaking into a, a violent phase, we would have all been better off in all kinds of ways. So one of the things we try to do is focus <coughs> on preventive action. Uh, and our ultimate objective through our training activities is to professionalize the role of the peacemaker. And, and this uh, we can talk about a bit further. It really gets to look at what do you train foreign service officers for? Is it just to represent the government, uh, to promote our commercial interests, to try to deal with uh, foreign publics? Or do we make them more proactive conflict managers? Now, <clears throat> underlying work is a basic question that uh, I, I put on the table. Peace. What does it mean? You know, one of the reasons we've attracted some uh, interest and support of late is you, people hear the word peace and it's a lot nicer to hear that word than to hear people talking about war. But what does peace really mean? Is it a condition uh, or is it something you've got to keep working at? <clears throat> in my view and uh, in my time at the Institute, I've been able, I think, to spread it around a little bit. We, we have to look at peace not as a stable condition. Conflict is really inherent in, uh, in the human condition. And so our work really uh, is designed to try to figure out ways through processes of conflict management uh, to deal with conflicts uh, before, before they turn, turn violent. And this has led to uh, uh, ways of organizing our work that I want to talk about in, in a little more detail. Uh, simple bell curve, uh, but it's turned out to be uh, a very uh, valuable, useful uh, uh, heuristic device for thinking about how you develop programs and capabilities to deal with conflict. If we think about a situation over time, you can go through a period where tensions rise uh, and then hopefully subside, uh, subside. And as I said earlier, in our view, if we can put more emphasis on prevention and take conflicts that are one way or another always going to be there, the objective is to try to prevent the conflict from escalating to a point where it crosses the line into a violent phase. And so this, this conception uh, has helped us develop uh, a series of programs built around the following. I always love these razzle-dazzle computer, uh, computer techniques, uh, where we focus on routine diplomacy, more preventive action, dealing with crises, uh, and on through the, the cycle, the phases of conflict. And uh, most of our work of late has focused on the pre-conflict uh, phase, uh, as I'll mention. Uh, but we've developed a series of programs that, uh, and activities that really uh, cover, cover all the, uh, the phases of, of the conflict cycle. Routine diplomacy. Uh, Mel has mentioned uh, what personally has been for me uh, an area of real interest. This the stack of books, which is here to intimidate all you scholars, represents uh, almost 20 years of uh, work by, by me and my colleagues. When I left uh, the employment of, uh, of Henry Kissinger, uh, one of the things that really impressed me about, uh, about Kissinger uh, was, he was, you know, as you all know, he was trained as a European historian. He had been dealt with the Europeans, he had dealt with uh, the Soviets, the Russians for many years. He was Shocked is maybe a little too strong, but he was quite impressed when he started dealing with the Chinese in 1971 to, 
discover that they conducted diplomacy in a very unique and a very Chinese way. The, the, the leaders that he dealt with, Chairman Mao, Zhou Enlai, and later Deng Xiaoping, these may have been uh, com committed Marxists or communists, but they dealt with him and they managed the negotiations, the diplomacy in a very Chinese way. And I remember uh, going in uh, with uh, President Ford into Chairman Mao's study, this is 1975, and all the bookshelves around uh, uh, Mao's retreat were all books in Chinese history. He wasn't just reading Marxist tracts. He, he was a deep student of the history of his own, own country. Anyway, after the, the privilege of having watched this diplomacy at some close range, uh, after I left the government and went to the Rand Corporation, I wrote a book about Chinese negotiating behavior. And uh, uh, what we discovered in the process of this and other aspects of uh, our work on all these books is that the State Department does not train negotiators. It, uh, it is a mentoring system that uh, uh, Foreign Service officers who are, if you like, uh, sort of natural born negotiators, they, they pick, up, pick up negotiating skills on the job and then get put in positions where they're able to uh, manage a negotiation, but there's no formal uh, sensitization or training, for example, in uh, cross-cultural perspectives. And uh, just uh, to very quickly uh, summarize what, uh, well, let me say that uh, as a kind of bookend to the China study, and these were all other studies that dealt with uh, North Korea, a really interesting case of a very weak failed society but is able to gain leverage and exercise an infuriating amount of influence through its uh, negotiating techniques. Uh, we've done one on Japan, on Russia, on France. Uh, we recently published one on Iran and about to come out one, with one on Pakistan. And these books are designed to roll into professional training work that, again, the State Department uh, doesn't do. And uh, as Mel indicated, the most recent was this book that we did on American negotiating behavior. Uh, why study American negotiating behavior? There's a quote at the uh, outset of the book that obviously reflects my own professional training. It's from the second century BC uh, Chinese strategist Sunzi, uh, which uh, goes basically, if you know your adversary and you know yourself, in a hundred battles, you'll be victorious. And that made a lot of sense to me. And uh, so we figured, having done all these other studies, we better take a look at ourselves. And as Mel indicated, we began by getting foreigners to tell us how they thought we behaved. And then we went to our own diplomats. And they, they said, basically, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's right. Now, what is the difference between the American style and the Chinese style because the differences are relevant. Chinese negotiating behavior is, is basically a relational process, whereas for the United States, for us, it's transactional. Our diplomats tend to be lawyers, trained as lawyers or businessmen. They, they want to cut deals and uh, they'll identify a problem. They're dealing with a counterpart and over a certain period of time, they will try to uh, uh, structure an agreement and, and get an agreement to cut a deal. For the Chinese, the, the key to the uh, effectiveness of their diplomacy is, diplomacy is building a personal relationship. And the key, uh, for those of you who may know, know Chinese, the, the key cultural concept is guanxi, which means a connection. Who are you connected with? Who do you have family or professional or other relationships with? And if you've got good guanxi with somebody, then you've got a working relationship. And how do you know if you've got good guanxi? In the case of Kissinger, after I think it was his third visit to China, uh, Zhou Enlai welcomed him to uh, Beijing as a Lao Pangyo, an old friend. And if they call you an old friend, you've got good guanxi, which means they think you're somewhat sympathetic, you understand their situation, and that you're somebody you can work with. But of course, then Kissinger discovered that if you're an old friend, 
you're not only there for nice meals and interesting discussion, you're there to deliver a deal to protect the relationship. And uh, Henry Kissinger became an international superstar after a secret trip to China in the summer of 1971. Uh, and uh, that became, uh, just at a personal level, a really valuable thing for, for this diplomat. His, uh, his credibility was enormous uh, because of all the intrigue and the, the, the appeal of this uh, dramatic diplomatic maneuver. But he was then trapped to some degree uh, because he wanted to protect that, uh, that, the credibility that came for him with that good relationship with China. So when the Chinese uh, frowned a bit and said, if you don't uh, complete uh, the normalization process, uh, maybe you're not an old friend of ours anymore. And, and that was the way they tried to put uh, real pressure uh, on, on Kissinger. And, uh, we can see the way they organized, they, the Chinese, organized their foreign ministry to, to play on this. The current foreign minister of China, Yang Jiechi, is also known as Tiger Yang. Tiger Yang began his career as an interpreter uh, for uh, George Herbert Walker Bush when he was the head of our liaison office in Beijing back in the, the early 1970s. And because of that personal relationship, as Bush advanced his political career, Tiger Young has his career advanced. And because of his guanxi, his connections with important political figures in our system, he is today the foreign minister. Well, in our, and the Chinese, as we've watched them now over several decades, have done a very effective job of training a generation of diplomats who know their counterparts in our system. They've learned how to work Congress. They've developed media contacts. They know political figures. And they promote these people to main, be able to use that guanxi, that, that connection. Our system is built rather differently, that diplomatic assignments generally, particularly at the ambassadorial level, roughly three years, and you rotate people through our notion of an effective diplomat is like a general officer in the military, it's a generalist. And one of the great things that uh, people fear in our system is what uh, generally is referred to as localitis or clientitis, that you don't want somebody in a position so long that they lose perspective on what the interests of our own country are and they become apologists for the country in which they're, they're assigned. Well, that's, that's an extreme issue, but it, it is a perspective that does affect the, the personnel system, the way we train and deploy uh, our diplomats. Well, if we had more time, I, I would go through some of the other uh, studies here uh, that we've done. But the key point is uh, the Institute of Peace, something new, something designed to try to uh, help the country deal with the, the world has taken on a project that up till now has not been a part of the way the Foreign Services has operated. And one of the things we're now doing using all this razzle-dazzle technology uh, is to convert all these books. I mean, very few diplomats, Foreign Service people take the time, particularly late in their career, to read these books. So we're, uh, we're putting them on computer in a way that will hopefully make them accessible to a an assistant secretary of state or a special envoy who's negotiating a problem so that he can pull up on, on his computer information about how the government he's about to engage will try to manage him. One of the examples I like to give is, uh, is hospitality. If you're going to build good guanxi, good connections with people, how do you do it? Uh, the Chinese do it through their cuisine. As we all know, the Chinese have a world-class cuisine. <clears throat> and uh, I only half jokingly say, if you want to handcuff the Chinese in running a diplomatic mission, what you do is you send home the cooks. If the Chinese can't use their hospitality, they really can't develop those personal relationships, and they use them. When Nixon went to China in early 72, uh, the Chinese gave a welcoming banquet, and Zhou Enlai, the foreign minister, he went around the room. There were 176 Americans in the, uh, in the delegation. 
in the Great Hall of the People. And Joe and Lai had a very small, thimble-sized glass of Maltai liquor, which you've probably heard about. It's this very fiery, 200-proof uh, sorghum liquor. Uh, and Joe and Lai had one little glass, and he went around the room toasting every American. All he was doing is wetting his upper lip. Well, the Americans were knocking back the... <laughs> And I've had other experiences. The Chinese try to use their, their drinking to get you drunk. What they want to do is negotiate with you when you're, you're really drunk. How does that relate to other, other diplomatic behavior? If you go to Russia, and I've dealt with, with the Russians, they try to get drunk with you. <laughs> I mean, we can laugh at it, but the fact is alcoholism is a big problem in their society and the reasons for it, but their diplomatic practice, very different. When I negotiated the Cambodia settlement, uh, the French were the co-hosts. We'd go back and forth between New, New York and Paris. The French would kill us every time we were in Paris with their cuisine and their drinking behavior of fine wines to show you how cultured their, their society is. And, and we just the, again, the cuisine of France, like the cuisine of China, is really world class, and they use it as part of their diplomatic behavior. For the United States, uh, it is not that we are unhospitable, but Congress will not fund what we, what most foreign diplomats consider adequate hospitality. Indeed, I've been humiliated in dealings with some very low-income, low-GDP countries who will load up a table and give you an overwhelming bit of cuisine, and we're, we're really very modest in, the, in our use of hospitality because, again, it's viewed as extravagant, and uh, uh, just the, the attitude up in Congress is we don't want to fund uh, excessive hospitality, which really does, in dealing with a number of countries, constrain our ability to develop working, working relationships. So again, these books are full of perspectives on use of language. Uh, if you look at the way the Israelis interact with the Palestinians, the Israelis are not super, they're Talmudic, they're legalistic. And the way they work out deals is with meticulously detailed and defined uh, agreements. For the Palestinians, they're, they're very emotional in their, their language. They look at their history and uh, their circumstances in a, in a very uh, emotive way uh, while the Israelis are trying to work out these very uh, uh, d detailed uh, legalistic agreements. So how do you encourage diplomacy where you have some really uh, great disparities in negotiating behavior? That's what this, this material is trying to deal with. Let me... Uh, not, again, go through all of this stuff, uh, but there is some very interesting work being done that we've, uh, uh, that we've sponsored on what is referred to as strategic nonviolent conflict, or it's basically uh, civil action. Uh, one of the ways that, uh, and this is the work that uh, uh, Peter Ackerman and a number of others have done out of the Einstein Institute up in uh, Cambridge and now down in Washington at the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, if you look at the way that uh, Marcos in the Philippines was brought down, or uh, 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 Milosevic uh, in the Balkans, or I could run through about 30 other examples, it wasn't a shoot 'em up that got him out of office. It was a mobilized civil population that basically uh, refused to cooperate with a dictatorial regime. And uh, what uh, Ackerman and company have gone, done is come up with techniques uh, for opposition movements to organize themselves in whatever limited political space exists in a diplomatic, or, I mean, a dictatorial environment, and to put real public pressure uh, on, uh, on a repressive regime. And one of the things they've discovered in their studies of history is, is a repetitive pattern. If, if an opposition movement shoots its way into power, and Cuba would be a good example, it's probably going to rule with a gun. But if a civilian society has organized itself to put pressure on the, the bad guys, on the leadership, 
it's almost, it's building the institutions and the, the culture uh, for participatory uh, democratic uh, politics. So this is, in terms of our mission, an effort to come up with ways of promoting regime change where you're dealing with di dictatorships in a nonviolent and ultimately a more uh, constructive, constructive manner. Um, again, I'm not going to uh, go through all of these, but uh, let me uh, point to uh, one area that has gotten us into some interesting work that our founding fathers and mothers never would have anticipated. In 1994, uh, I got a call from General Tony Zinni, who said, I've got my war fighting Marines, but the Clinton administration is sending them off on peacekeeping missions. I need somebody to help me retrain them for these very new kinds of responsibilities where they're not pointing their, their rifles at, at villagers, but they've got to negotiate with them. And uh, so we began training the military and then the civilian police who in that period of time would go into the Balkans. Civilian police were necessary to bring security to uh, communities in the wake of the Balkans war so that civil society and local government could begin to uh, reconstitute themselves in a more secure environment. And so we were taking American police officers and training them up to operate in, uh, in these very different, uh, very different uh, cultures. Most of our work, as I suggested earlier, has really dealt with the, the post-conflict phase of conflict management. Uh, we have offices today in uh, ba Baghdad and Kabul, and we are working with uh, local activists, training them in uh, conflict management uh, skills. And our military, interesting enough, has come to the Institute people in these, in these countries seeking help in promoting political reconciliation. Uh, you've probably heard uh, just from reading the press of the so-called Anbar Awakening, uh, where the Sunni insurgents uh, basically fed up with uh, and trapped in their, uh, their conflicts, their violent conflicts with, uh, with local sheikhs on, on the Shiite side of the equation. They, they wanted to break out of that pattern. So our 10th Mountain Division came to the institute and said, would you help broker a peace deal between these, these local sheikhs, Sunni and Shiite? And so over a four month period, our people working in an environment where the military provided a basic element of security, enabled the local combatants uh, to uh, come to a peacekeeping agreement. And that was the start of the Anbar awakening. Uh, we're, we're, I could give you, again, a range of examples of where our people are creating the institutions of conflict management that hopefully will, in the case of uh, both Iraq and Af Afghanistan, will bring stability. Territorial conflicts are a big deal up in Kirkuk in Iraq, uh, in areas of Afghanistan. And we've helped the local people establish uh, tribunals uh, which provide a quasi-legalistic way of dealing with these property disputes. So they're dealt with uh, in a negotiating environment uh, rather than one of, uh, of, of violence. And again, you'll, you'll see here a whole range of activities, promotion of the rule of law, uh, training locals to deal with ethnic uh, and other forms of conflict, which is the way that the Institute of Peace uh, tries to fill out, uh, promote its uh, uh, its mandate from Congress. There are a variety of, uh, sorry, got it upside down. There are a variety of what we refer to as centers of innovation that try to develop these techniques of conflict management, the rule of law. Religion and peacemaking, as I mentioned earlier, was a real innovation. When the character of conflict changed, uh, where the State Department wasn't empowered and used to dealing with the religious groups, we we had uh, an opportunity to make a contribution there. We're looking at new technologies. The internet, for example, uh, in the early 90s when the internet suddenly became uh, quite uh, actively in use, we thought, aha, this is gonna be a great vehicle for getting 
groups together who normally don't communicate with, with one another. We were thinking in particular about the military and the humanitarian assistance, non-NGOs, non-governmental organizations. The NGOs don't want to work with the military because they're, they want to remain unarmed and they, their people are at risk if they're seen as being related to the military. So the internet seemed to be a way of enabling them to coordinate their activities. The only problem is that almost any technology you come up with cuts both ways. And what we've discovered more recently is the bad guys have used, learned to use the internet for recruitment, for propaganda, for fundraising. And so uh, one of the things we look at is, is how do we maximize the impact of these new technologies for, uh, for good purposes. Marcos in the Philippines was brought down by cell phones. Cell phones are a great vehicle for coordinating mass civil action, and repressive governments are having a hard time controlling these technologies for purposes that we would consider, consider good. So <clears throat> the Institute of Peace, some people say, oh, you're a think tank. Uh, we think we've grown beyond that. Our mantra is that we think, act, teach, and train, and we take our analytical work and roll it into our on-the-ground programs, uh, and then feed them back into our teaching and training activities, and, and the cycle will, will repeat itself as a way of, of looking, at our, at looking at our work. What of the future for, for the Institute of Peace? And here I'll get off into uh, how we make our institution permanent. There are a lot of people in Washington who uh, were skeptical about the Institute. Uh, some of our creators, uh, I talked to uh, uh, Paul, Congressman Paul Simon about this, can, uh, Congre uh, Senator Nancy Kassenbaum, others, they, Sam Nunn, they never thought the Institute would survive. It, it sounded too peacenicky, too uh, unrelated to what many people said was the, the real, what should be the, the focus of our national security. People somehow feel more secure with sticks than with carrots, to put it uh, in, in kind of the, ver the vernacular. Uh, why have we been able to build uh, support? It's one, because the world changed in ways that I talked about. And people uh, concluded that, hey, always leading with the military was too costly, too dangerous. And then when the Cold War ended, and in the 90s, we developed the kinds of programs I've talked about. Uh, people said, hmm, maybe there is some value added in the Institute of Peace. Our budget then was about $20 million a year, which is, as Senator Tom Harkin puts it, it's pencil dust in terms of federal budgets. Uh, but there were several efforts to zero out our, uh, our budget over the years. Uh, but. Uh, in 1995 and 96, uh, Senator Sam Nunn and uh, Under Secretary of the Navy Richard Danzig helped us acquire uh, a parking lot uh, at the corner of uh, 23rd and Constitution Avenue. There's the Lincoln Memorial. <coughs> and uh, the Navy, this is known as Navy Hill or the Potomac Annex of the Navy. The Navy people said, if you can keep us out of one war, whatever monetary investment uh, we've made in you is worth it. There's only one thing we want for giving you this site. What's the most valuable resource, uh, certainly in Washington, but I see it's the most valuable resource in this town. It's parking. <laughs> the Navy said, okay, uh, you, can, you can have our parking lot, but you gotta put the parking underground, which we, we've now done. And so we acquired a unique piece of land that we refer to as the war and peace corner of the National Ball. I mean, we're, we're about a three minute walk across Constitution Avenue from the Vietnam Memorial. We're staring at the Lincoln and all these other memorials to war. And we now, through uh, a piece of dramatic, uh, well, let me, let me just point out that looked at from uh, a different angle, uh, we're almost across the street from the State Department. Uh, which is why we think our work will amount to a kind of change agent impact 
if we do our programming right on the way the State Department uh, trains and manages its, its uh, work. In addition to this parking area, we've also acquired, thanks to uh, Senator John Warner, these two additional Navy buildings which house the Navy's Bureau of Medicine and Surgery. The Navy is moving out to uh, Bethesda and we will acquire these buildings in another year. We will house in those buildings uh, a professional training activity. Um, this is the design that uh, after a na a, an international competition for a building was produced by architect Moshe Safdi. Extremely imaginative uh, uh, design. Uh, that the Commission of Fine Arts, which has to approve buildings in the mall area, thought was a lot nicer than just that, that parking lot. And uh, if you go to Washington today, if you fly in to Wa uh, Reagan Airport, you're going to see a building on that site uh, that looks just about like this. It's about a month away uh, from completion. Looked at from another angle, uh, this would be uh, 23rd Street, Constitution Avenue. Uh, this building houses all the professional training work I've talked about. And here is the entrance to what is our public education space. Our, our education work begins in the high schools. Every year we run what's called the National Peace Essay Contest in the high schools. And we get five, 7,000 kids around the country writing essays on some war and peace theme. Each state selects a winner. We bring the winner to Washington. And having been involved in something similar when I was 15 years old, I can tell you that it's pretty impressive to come to your national capital and see those memorials. And uh, we think this is a way of attracting new generations to careers in international uh, affairs. This entryway is uh, the access to underneath this, this is what we call Peacemaker Plaza. Uh, and uh, there's a big atrium here that's named after George Schultz, uh, and these are all our offices. But underneath this atrium area are 20,000 square feet where we'll have exhibits that will reach out to the public and those students who we work with, giving them a general education or exposure to the, the work of the Institute of Peace. And then the buildings that I showed you up here where our professional training activity will occur, that will basically enable us to fully fill out our uh, mission from Congress as it was described in that, uh, that early, in that early uh, slide that uh, I ran by you. Now, what does this all mean for the future? Oops. I wish I could leave, leave you with a, uh, a kind of upbeat perspective on the world. But uh, frankly, I'm, I'm sort of uh, pessimistic, and uh, maybe if there's any time for uh, some discussion, we can get off into it. Unlike uh, earlier phases during the 20th century, in particular world affairs, I think uh, we and lots of other countries of concern deal with a range of complex challenges that are not only unfamiliar to, uh, but they're not simple. The, the, the bipolar, the bifurcated world of, of the Cold War era, where we knew who the adversary was and we were able to mobilize our resources against it. That's not the character of the world we're dealing with. And I won't repeat the, the perspectives that I gave at the outset of uh, the character of challenges uh, we, uh, we face. But the important point is we're unlikely to see emerge a kind of grand strategy for how to deal with the world. <clears throat> world War II, the grand strategy was very simple, unconditional surrender. And it really happened overnight. In the Cold War, it took us all, over 15 years from, from the Soviet subversion in Eastern Europe, uh, past the Cuban Missile Crisis, to come up with a policy perspective that basically had uh, political public support, and that was to deter the Soviet Union and try to contain their, their subversive and other activities uh, around the world. I don't believe we're going to come up with some kind of grand strategy or perspective on dealing with the world that uh, uh, has the kind of simplicity or mind-grabbing character of these earlier 
pr approaches to dealing with the world. Now, why is it important to have that kind of a grand strategy? As Yogi Berra, I guess it was, would say, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any place will get you there. But the fact is that bureaucracies need a sense of policy direction. Congress needs a sense of where you're trying to move things if they're going to give you money. And if you want public support, again, you've got to explain to the public uh, what your foreign policy, your national security policy all, is all about. And I think we're, we're going to be in for an extended period of trying to figure out and convey to the public uh, what this world uh, is all about. One aspect that's important for the work of the Institute is uh, I think it's pretty clear that we're going to have to put much more emphasis on the non-military aspects of our dealings with the world, diplomacy, economic resources, in particular, even though our military and intelligence capacities, unfortunately, are going to be uh, of uh, a requirement and necessity in terms of our national security, but in a very modified way. And again, here you have a Secretary of Defense that is trying to cut back on defense spending and put more resources into diplomacy. So I don't see any quick fixes uh, that the Cold War pattern, uh, which again took about 15 years, much less World War II, where the change came overnight. I think we're, we're in for an extended period of trying to make adaptations. But then, frankly, I come up with a, a rather discouraging perspective. I think there are many aspects of the world we're trying to deal with that are, that are unmanageable. Climate change. Are we really going to get uh, find policies and approaches and collaborations with uh, other countries abroad to, to mi mitigate the impact of, uh, of climate change? I'm, I'm a skeptic that climate is changing, you know, we live with the effects of that day by day, but creating an international coalition, doing the kinds of things that are really going to make a difference, I'm not sure. Nuclear proliferation, a fundamental element of the security environment today, I'm just very skeptical that the international community uh, is going to get it, uh, get it under control. And then you have really the most disturbing aspect of things that the institutions that we look to to help us manage the world really are not in good repute. The United Nations, no one sees the UN as an effective vehicle for dealing with many of the fundamental problems that we face, the nuclear proliferation issue uh, as well. Wall Street, we've just been through this big economic crisis. Uh, the issues we've seen in various religious communities, the polarization in our political institutions, the rise of the Tea Party, all of those are indications of a loss of confidence in our institutions. And uh, uh, what, what institution really has some credibility these days? Frankly, it's the military uh, that has been d adaptive and, and uh, uh, put out on very challenging assignments has really uh, risen to the, the challenges in many ways. So I just leave you with this this perspective and a set of questions of where the world is headed and uh, the question of whether uh, we're going to be able to manage things. But if you keep paying your taxes, the work of the Institute of Peace will continue and we'll try to continue to make our contribution as modest as it might be. Well, thank you very much for your time, your attention. Somebody in the back. I was going to hold back. I'd be interested in your comments about the lack of interest on the part of the State Department, at least in the past, with regard to training of diplomats in negotiations, because they train in language skills and other kinds of things, 
and uh, you've produced these materials, but I'm, I'm concerned on behalf of all of us that there isn't more of a buy-in, at, at least as you've pres presented it. So could you speak more about that and, and what strategies, or, or have, have you had talks with Secretary Clinton now? Is, is, that some, is that a culture that can change? That's a very, very good question. <clears throat> Secretary of State uh, Con Condoleezza Rice started an initiative uh, in the next to last year of her tentative tenure called Transformational Diplomacy. And she wasn't around long enough to really flesh it out, but what she basically did was reassign diplomats who were in the nice, comfortable uh, West European embassies to Iraq, Afghanistan, to the, some of the real challenging hardship posts. And they had done some work in her department on how further changing the way we train and deploy our foreign service officers uh, might be carried out. And then her tenure ended and, and she moved on. Uh, the Secretary of State, Clinton, has just run through a review process, the first that was ever done in the State Department called the Quadrennial uh, Diplomacy and Development uh, Assessment. Uh, and uh, or review. Uh, the State, uh, the uh, Defense Department has done one, Homeland Security has done one, the intelligence people have done one. So there's now, over the past year, been a very uh, thorough look at uh, what is needed is to upgrade all of our national institutions to deal with this, this world. What stands in the way of making progress? First, there's the issue of stovepiping, one of the favorite terms that people who look at the bureaucracy always revert to. These, these are assessments were carried out largely independent of one another. So how do you integrate them? How do you come up with a broader a national game plan for upgrading and making more collaborative our national institutions? That has not yet been done. Uh, if Secretary Clinton is in her office long enough to uh, follow through on some of the things I know she's thinking about as a re result of this uh, quadrennial defense and diplomacy review, perhaps she will bring about some changes. Um, <clears throat> but in my view, the only way you're really going to get fundamental change is by taking the initiative out of the big bureaucracies in any one administration and putting it in Congress. If you, those of you who uh, have long memories. There was an effort in the early 1950s called Ristonization. Henry Riston uh, was the president of Brown University, and he was, he was empowered to run a national commission to reevaluate our diplomacy. And uh, the importance of doing it out of Congress is if you don't get buy-in on a game plan for the people who provide the money, you're going to run into that old problem that all the resources naturally flow to defense. People in Congress are, are reluctant uh, to fund the State Department. <clears throat> the uh, one idea is, is to create an integrated national security foreign policy agenda. So apart from the 700 billion or whatever we put in defense, you create a larger pot of money and then you can sort of sneak past or override the political resistance to funding state and have the resources allocated in what uh, would be considered a more rational or at least a more productive manner. So a lot of this is swirling around the system now and uh, hopefully some of it will take hold and there will be a follow through to make these adjustments. I'm interested in hearing about your thoughts of um, using public diplomacy as an effective tool for Iraq and Afghanistan, particularly since we're not dealing with, or rather since we are dealing with non-state actors such as terrorist groups. Right. How effective do you see pu uh, public diplomacy being in that region? Right. Again, a good question. And uh, someone watching the government fa up fairly close over the last, uh, since 9-11, uh, 
uh, one of the abject failures has been our public diplomacy measure. They brought in uh, someone from Madison Avenue who was great at selling toothpaste or whatever <laughs> to, uh, as the phrase goes, to tell America's story to the world. And the conception was fundamentally flawed. You know, us, us guys, you know, from our society trying to communicate to uh, people living in other centuries in totally different environments won't work. The conception of public diplomacy that uh, makes sense to me and has been part of the Institute's work is not for us to deliver the message, but to, to find people in Iraq, Afghanistan, who want reconciliation, who want stabilization, who oppose the kind of violence that uh, the extremists are wreaking. And so the, the, the phrase we've come up with is uh, mobilize the moderates and isolate the, the extremists. And so what, in my, in my view, we are, and I think we're doing this in some measure because our military under, uh, takes that approach and their civil affairs officers try to identify community leaders individuals of stature in these societies who want to work with us, uh, however quietly, uh, because they don't want to just be seen as, uh, as uh, cat's paws or agents of the United States, but to empower them in a variety of ways to speak out in, about issues, policy directions that, that we view as consonant with what we're trying to achieve. So it's a different conception of how, do you, how you reach these publics. And uh, I think it's having some success, but I, I haven't seen an overall evaluation of it. But that's a conception that uh, is worth thinking about. Okay. Hi. I just want to say that I want to just congratulate you for a wonderful speech. And I'd like you all to give him a nice one, round of applause. <laughs> and my only question that I have is that he, he, given wasn't, the, he wasn't paid to say that. Yeah, the only question that I have is that uh, given our tremendous crisis in our public schools these days, I was wondering what role do you think that our public education K through 12 plays in uh, promoting, I guess, a semi sense of uh, white supremacy or just a, whether there is a supremacy of race or what role it can play, you know, to, to uh, to break down these barriers that we have in terms of race. And so I'd like to have your input. Uh, that's a big question, but I'll, um, what I would really comment, comment on is how profound the changes in our society uh, really are that deal with this issue. <clears throat> my, my father, uh, during the 1940s, uh, his business was selling furniture from factories in North Carolina to retail outlets in the North. And when he'd go down to the South, the hotels would have signs uh, that said, no Catholics, Jews, or Negroes allowed. Ten, you know, 20 years later, uh, the civil rights movement passed. It, again, was turmoil on this, this campus. Today, one way I like to look at it is when I go to, uh, through the airports, look at the people going through the airports. You know, you, you see the multi-ethnic diversity of this society and of the in-migration that has come about in dramatic ways over the last couple of decades. And uh, uh, all I can tell you is I don't see this as a white Anglo-Saxon world anymore. And I think uh, from the interactions that I see from my grandchildren uh, and everything else going on in, uh, in society, whether it's the role of women now leading uh, uh, all sorts of institutions in a way that 20 years ago would have been unimaginable, the dramatic success of South Asian immigrants in our economy. I mean, you can go through these issues you know, sector by sector, area by area of our society, I just see a totally different situation where issues of racism and gender discrimination and ethnic uh, prejudice 
is melting away. It ain't gone away overnight. Uh, but it's a totally different environment even within my lifetime. So I'm not, I'm not pessimistic. And uh, as my wife keeps uh, saying, you know, thank goodness for the relatively open in-migration policies of this society because the migrants bring enormous uh, skills, energy, uh, enthusiasm to working in this society. And uh, how we funded this building a lot of the money has come from second generation or hyphenated Americans who have made a lot of money in the society. Uh, they're not, their ancestors didn't come over on the Mayflower, but they've done very well in this society and they want to pay back. And uh, so we've gotten uh, some very large donations for our, gil our building for, for people with uh, uh, all kinds of backgrounds who want to say thank you to the United States for having given them the opportunity to succeed. So I, I tend to be pretty optimistic on, on that issue. And, uh, the, you know, they really hadn't reconciled that yet. Right. And I wonder if you had any um, input on how you continue the reconciliation through into routine diplomacy and keep it from escalating. Right. Uh, she wasn't, again, that wasn't a lower of a, a pre-fed question. One of the things we work on in educational environments is trying to uh, modify historical narratives. Uh, and it is true that, uh, and it's something that Americans, our culture is not a, highly attuned to. We, we don't have a sense of history. Uh, our history you know, our election cycles, it's forward looking, it's innovation. If you go to China, you know, 5,000 years of history and they're very conscious of the weight of their, their traditions on their role in the world, which may turn out to be a problem. But, uh, and then uh, uh, as you pointed out in the Balkans, the, the conflicts there that go back to uh, the 14th century or whatever, they're still in the Israeli-Palestinian situation, the, the history that those two communities look at guarantee you're going to have ongoing conflict. So one of the things we have done is worked with teachers uh, and others to try to uh, address and hopefully encourage communities to come up with a shared narrative of history and to not to do away with uh, the, the traumas of the past but to see that there, there may be shared traumas uh, and that uh, to be trapped in history uh, is really to fa face a very bleak future. So dealing with uh, the challenge of history and how it's viewed is a very important element in promoting reconciliation. It's something we work on. Thank you, well, thank you, all for thank you again very much. Thank you.